Um, welcome, everyone, to our panel on building an effective open source program office. My name is Aaron <coughs> Williamson. I'm an independent open source attorney uh, advising companies on open source licensing, process, policy, <coughs> et cetera. I also work with Finos to run the open source readiness program there, um, where we gather together our members and others within the financial technology community to uh, discuss best practices for building out open source policy and process. Um, I will allow the other panelists to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Andrew on my left. Hello, everyone. At least I think there are people out there. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Andrew Aitken, and I'm the global open source practice leader uh, for Wipro Technologies. If you're not familiar with them, we're one of the large global systems integrators, around $9 billion in revenue. And today, we probably around, have around 25,000 plus open source developers. Uh, this is actually around my 21st year in, in open source. Uh, so go back a, a little ways here, and, and uh, we do a lot of work today around helping enterprises figure out what their open source strategy should be, and, and how they, part of that's how they should build an uh, effective program office. Thank you. Karan? Hello, everyone. My name is Karan. I work for Fujitsu Network Communications, so it's a, it's a telecom uh, company. So mm -hmm. I work uh, as an mm -hmm. open source process lead uh, for Fujitsu. And I've been working in open source industry for quite some time. We started off in India working for Samsung and then came here and worked for Black Duck Software. So, uh, so yeah, so I handle the open source program for this right now. Hi, uh, my name is Murli Kaundini. I'm with Wells Fargo, uh, the CTO's <coughs> office. Uh, Wells Fargo is a very large bank, 270,000 employees and 40,000 technology, so we you know, consume a lot of open source software, and uh, we uh, you know, have been you know, optimizing our you know, technology program, you know, balancing developer productivity with risk mitigation, so I wanted to share some thoughts there. Great, thank you. Um, so Andrew, I'd like to start with you. Um, you know, this panel is about building an open source program office. Mm -hmm. um, first, I'd like to <clears throat> set the stage by uh, having you um, go over sort of what, what are the components of an open source program, an open source program office, and sort of how the parts interrelate. Okay. So <clears throat> some of that is, is kind of obvious. Like it has to be cross-functional, right? It has to have representatives from all the key stakeholders in an organization. And what a lot of people miss about that is the operational elements. So it, it's good to have representatives, even if they're just part-time, from procurement and HR. Right, legal's pretty obvious, development's pretty obvious, architecture's pretty obvious, and so on. But a lot of organizations miss the fact that you need to have some representation from, from HR and, and procurement. Um, and one of the first, uh, and, and sorry, the other piece that some organizations miss is it's always good to have an executive sponsor. So those are, those are some of the, the core elements and aspects. And the other piece is, from a, for a program office, don't always just focus on the tactical and execution elements of, of running a program and making sure you're compliant and that you have a consumption and contribution model. Uh, pay attention to some of the higher order aspects. Right? Figure out why you're actually building a program office. What are the goals, mission, vision? Those are squishy things, but they're really, really <coughs> important. And then lastly, and then I'll let, let and move on, success metrics. Right? You have to be able to measure how effective your program office is. So. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, Karan and Mur Murley, you have both been involved in building the open source program mm -hmm. um, at your respective enterprises, um, coming from different spaces. So Fujitsu, Fujitsu ne Network Communication builds enterprise hardware for telecommunications, mm -hmm. and obviously, Morally, you're at a very different institution at a, at a large bank's technology organization. But what are some of the lessons you've learned about, about how to structure and build out an open source program office um, from your experience doing so at your enterprises? So Fujitsu, uh, I'll let's start. So, so Fujitsu just doesn't do telecom. They do a lot of other things, right? But I work for a network communication. So the biggest problem that I see is scaling the program office <coughs> from one division to the whole enterprise. So, uh, so no other, like, there are business units, small, small, small business units using open source, but not really enhancing the way they should use it. So there is a program office in one business unit. How can we scale that across the enterprise? So what I believe is, uh, is having open source program office as a service 
to uh, to all the different business units. Like like some companies have IT as a service, so why not open source program office mm. as a service? So at Fujitsu, we are looking into something that, but uh, but yeah, this that's the biggest problem that I see uh, in in big enterprises like financial and mm. telecommunication and other things. Yeah, we have had a similar journey. I mean, as part of our you know supply chain management. We uh, manage the uh, ingress of software, whether it is vendor software or open source software, through the channel. And uh, given the uh, you know the nature of our you know industry and uh, the sensitivity towards risk, uh, you know we have uh, you know put in a, you know a set of processes to make sure that uh, we are thoughtful and methodical in the way we bring in. Uh, over the last uh, several years. There's been a lot of education, uh, letting the technology community understand the you know the spirit of the licensing, et cetera, and that has matured quite a bit. We have now begun to pivot because we can't just really have a program office, you know, you know, tr you know, triangulating the needs and the supply. You know, the pace at which software is changing. We are a global bank, uh, you know, lots and lots of developers consuming software. We recognize that we need, you know, automated machinery to manage the, you know, you know, procurement of software. So we've, uh, you know, begun to optimize, you know, the speed versus risk mitigation aspects. So, uh, you know, in conjunction with, you know, people, processes, we are also throwing more tools, you know, to make sure that the management and the you know, development of software is done, you know, without compromising any of our, you know, risk vectors. Great, thank you. Um, Karan, you mentioned this idea of running um, the open source program office as a service. Um, what, so what problems do you see that as solving and, and sort of what are the benefits versus other structures for? So the one thing that I've learned working in big enterprises is that everything is about money, right? So. So the thing is, like, open source program office is a cost to the company. So if you don't sell it as a service internally in a company, uh, they, no one would like to host that program office in their office. But if you expand that program office across all business units, the cost going to reduce. <clears throat> so that's, that's what I, I see, that it will resolve. And, and once, you, once we can show that progress, every business unit would love to own program office because it's not costing them anything, it's just like providing service internally. Yeah, yeah let me reflect on, on a little bit. So uh, we chatted before, and I really mm -hmm. like the idea of, a, of, a, of open source program office as, as a service offering, essentially, mm -hmm. in an organization. I'll, I'll tell you, <clears throat> every client we've worked with said, we are the most highly federated and distributed organization you know, that you've ever worked with in, in your past. And like, I've heard that at the beginning of every single time I engage with a client. You're all distributed. You're all highly federated. So the notion of a, of a OSPO as mm -hmm. a shared service, that's one way to, to approach that, that notion of a federated organization. But the other piece I want to, want to point out, when I talked about metrics earlier on, it's, it, it is, it can be pure overhead, but mm -hmm. it doesn't, that doesn't mean that, that you can't track it as... Uh, as a positive cost center, essentially. That's why I encourage you to bring in, bring in HR. HR knows the metrics for retaining and mm -hmm. recruiting developers. And an open source program office should make, sh should improve through the programs they bring to an organization, should be able to improve developer retention and, and recruitment. And HR knows those statistics pretty darn well. So if you can cut developer retention, I mean, if you can improve developer retention by 20% or reduce the cost of, of developer recruitment by 10%, those are hard, hard dollar numbers that you can apply to, mm -hmm. to the, the effect of the open source program office. And there are seven or eight or nine different metrics that you can use like that to show the value of a program office. Great. Uh, Morley, you're in the office of the CTO at Wells Fargo. Uh, I take it that's where the open source program is centered as well. Um, what how, how did it come to be there? And, and then I'd like to hear your thoughts, and then I guess moving this way, the other panelists on where the right location for an open source <laughs> program is within an enterprise. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Fargo, historically, you know, we were highly federated, uh, so uh, no different than many of our you know, competitors as well. But with the formation of the CTO office, we uh, you know, have uh, you know, created a central charter 
to simplify and rationalize technology, right? I think one of the things that uh, we looked at was this concept of a value stream, right? How do we really decompose our technology strategy into, you know, a couple of dozen value streams? And value streams, you know, is just a, you know, a managed service, right? When you think about, you know, your software development experience, uh, your open source channel is one of the you know sources that really drives the creation of value within the company. Now you know what we did was we integrated the supply chain function, which used to really perform all of the risk mitigation with regards to procuring open source, and paired it up with all of the CI/CD machinery. So, for example, you know it's very common you know for you know, applications to bring in you know, binaries through our dependency, you know, resolvers. Uh, so what we, you know, did was how do we really pair up the open source license verification with the dependency resolution so that the developer who's really looking to, you know, create value on top of existing open source products can proceed without really having to deal with a lot of friction and resistance in the enterprise. So that is, you know, where we really see in the yield because we really need to be thoughtful about you know, how do we really bring the legal perspective, the architecture perspective, the security perspective, the developer perspective, and tie it all into the machinery so at the end of the day, the developer can actually do what they really want. They're not you know, uh, you know, too fond of spending too much time understanding all these nuances. They just want this to work. And what we really need to do from the CTO office is you know, make the machinery such that they are thoughtful you know, in understanding what it is that they want to do, but at the same time, you know, uh, accelerate, you know, the, the velocity of software development. So if I hear you right, you're sort of sitting in the center of all of these other, uh, other departments and, um, you know, bringing together their concerns while also acting as, a, as an advocate for developers. Yeah. I mean, one of the classic examples that, you know, we've talked about it before, which is if you curated all of the open source software that you requested, and if you went through the thoughtful process of sourcing them and inventorying them, the fact of the matter is when you sit down and write software today, whether it is JavaScript or Python or Java or C Sharp, the fact is that you, know, you resolve your dependencies to a big graph of software that is really sourced in the source codes of the world. So you really need to make sure that as you resolve all of your dependencies, you're not really compromising what has really been established from a firm standard best practice on what is really okay. And that is where we actually see opportunity to speed things up, right? So, Great, thank you. Arun, where is the right place to, to host an open source program so, office and are you doing it? So basically, so when I started as an engineer, I thought engineering was the best place to host it. <laughs> then I did legal degree, so I thought legal is the best place to do it. <laughs> So I, so I basically don't know. So the thing is, it's depending on different organization, <clears throat> where, whichever works for you. But I think that for a big enterprise, the OSPO has to be a separate organization with stakeholders from every department in that. And then when you have something like that, you, have, you can scale it to each and every business unit. Whether you create it as a service, you give them for free, it's depending on how, however you want to do it, but, but I think it has to be a separate organization giving service to everyone. <coughs> it and should not be inside any engineering org. Thank you. Andrew, you've seen this done differently across many of your customers, presumably. What, mm -hmm. what have you seen work and, not, and, and fail? Uh, well, for, do we have lawyers in the room? I have a master's. Uh, a, a couple. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Don't put it in legal. <laughs> All right. Don't put it in legal. Legal has a really, really important role to, to, to play. Uh, or marketing. Let, less concern there, but I agree with these. Um, it, legal has a really important and, and critical and foundational role to play in a, in a program office. But housing the OSPO in or under the auspices of legal sends the wrong message to the developer community. At the end of the day, you have to have their, their buy-in. Because right? no matter what kind of a governance or compliance process you put in place, there are always ways to work around it. And just being in legal really does send the wrong message. So we typically recommend, uh, depending upon the org, we're talking to, this is financial services vertical, right? So 
notion of if you have a centralized uh, IT or shared IT group, shared services IT group, that's the right place. Central architecture group, that can be the right place. Um, so that's, uh, that's my opinion. Great. Um, so, you know, I think, I, as, as someone mentioned on stage earlier, I think it was Russell Green at DB, um, you know, while this whole process of becoming conversant with and, and getting on top of the open source situation feels like a new thing in financial services, um, it's, it's, um, it's something that, that many other industries have, have gone through this same process. And, and it seems like, you know, as, as an enterprise becomes aware of the issue, you know, the first focus is always on compliance. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, slowly it moves toward how should we be participating? How should we be contributing? How can we be collaborating with our peers in the open source community? Um, how, I'd like to hear from our panelists, how, how you see, you know, what are strategies for, for making that change within your own culture, within your own practices, from a compliance focus toward a more outward facing? How do we, how do we make the most of this uh, strategically? Andrew, you can go first. We'll go back the other way this time. <laughs> that, that's a good and that's a really essential question. So typically, when we get engaged, it, the first thing to do is go through triage. There's usually, you know, there, there's usually a, a perceived issue, okay, around compliance, whatever that might be, license compliance or IP leakage or whatever you want to call it. So the first part is, is typically triage. Let's figure out one... It's usually a perceived as opposed to a real problem, but that doesn't matter in the minds of the stakeholders, so you still have to treat it like a real problem. So address that, figure out what the compliance and the governance regime looks like, help them address immediate concerns, and then we typically recommend working on kind of three, three elements at the same time. One, building your, trying to build a lowest common denominator holistic enterprise wide open source strategy. A lot of big words there together, but it doesn't have to be a huge exercise. Right? Then it also recognize that policy and process are two separate tax or, or tracks and need to be addressed separately. Work on a policy first, really. That, that, and and there's, there's no policy for no matter how complex an organization you are that should be, worst case, 12, more than 12 pages long. Okay? And, it, and it should be less. Then you figure out how to instantiate that policy in a set of processes so that it's, it's not just pure overhead to your developers, again, because then you're not going to get buy-in. And while you're going through that, then work on the strategy. How are we going to implement it? How are we moving from a contributor, I mean, from a consumer to a contributor to even a publisher of open source? And why are we doing this? Yeah, great. So, Karan at FNC, how's, yeah, how's this so going? Yeah, so I think for a company like FNC have, was totally proprietary four or five years ago. Now we started using open source. The biggest uh, thing I think which is required is the education. Like com people who've been working in that company doesn't really know how to work with open source. Uh, <clears throat> like you need to educate them on license compliance, security. Uh, there are there is export compliance that you need to educate. And once you start contributing back, you need to educate them on the CLAs that you need to mm -hmm. sign uh, and how to basically the code of conduct. Uh, you go and uh, work with the different communities. So I think. Education, which is going to be like uh, forever, that we need to educate everyone. But uh, I think to start off with, that, that we should focus on that too, uh, on the education of all our developers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would add to that. You know, fundamentally, the uh, you know the the thought process involved in reviewing what is it that you want to consume and what are the terms and conditions with which you can consume is, you know, something that we've really done very well. We have, uh, you know, used a combination of human capital plus tools to get that thing solved. But the reality here is that this is not a world that stays still, right? So what was approved, you know, two years ago, you know, or even two months ago uh, may be changing. So you really need to have the means to respond to real-time changes to the licensing terms, et cetera, and bring that awareness to the developer community because you may really be, you know, operating under the model, you know, that you reviewed based on three months ago or six months ago, and that doesn't really cut it. It's almost like, you know, having the pulse on the wire and being able to do this on the time, which is why, you know, even between you doing development versus you deploying something into production setting, 
we have plenty of safety nets in place to make sure that you don't really put the bank at risk, which is very important. You really need to make sure that you really have the checks and balances to say, hey, you know, you did this you know, with a conservative posture, but you really need to get a lot more preventative as you really mature into the QA and UAT and fraud stages, et cetera. So you need to feel really confident in your processes Mm -hmm. um, internally on the consumption side before you before you feel exactly ready to open mm -hmm. up I see that uh, well good. our panelists have really answered the call to concision here I um, <laughs> I think we have time for a couple of questions from the audience if anyone would like to uh, to poll our panelists <clears throat> sir you talk about I'd agree. That was an, that was an omission on my part. They have they're absolutely critical as an element of a, a program office. And we recognize that a program office doesn't have to be ten full time people, even for the largest organizations. Right? But it can be a number of people half time in half time roles. Uh, so it, it really just depends on on your uh, your particular oper operating model. But security has to be a part of it. I was going to say, you know. I was with another large bank, uh, you know, in my prior life. Uh, one of the things that we recognized was some of the source forges that you go to to procure software, you know, unless you really vet them on, you know, how rigorous their processes are for publishing software into their forges, you could really have, you know, situations like Trojan horses where you are thinking that you're really getting your common logging utility and lo and behold, you brought in something that puts your you know, institution at risk. So you, know, you, you have to be very thorough in terms of vetting you know, or whitelisting these repositories from which you, you know, procure software. And you can't really you know, take the brand name and then say, hey, you know, that seems to be OK, and then you know, take comfort on it. You really need to continuously validate on whether you really saw abnormalities in the way you know you resolved it, and what exactly were the ingredients that you brought into the farm. And I, I think you're addressing. To me, that's a part of the role of, of what a, a program office should help figure out and yep. decide. Yeah. That you know that's one one key consideration right there. Yeah. Do you scan at ingestion? Do you scan pre-production, post-production? You know, there's a whole host of, of questions that the program office should be addressing. Yeah, if, one of the things that we realized as we, you know, fleshed out the value stream thinking was we identified value streams like, you know, site reliability engineering, resiliency, <laughs> cybersecurity, core banking, et cetera. But when you think about it fundamentally, you really want to be able to say, what is the behavior that you really see for your software and production? How exactly were they developed in the early stages of formation? And you want to have a tight correlation. <clears throat> if you don't have that tight correlation, whether you call it, you know, address it through cybersecurity or SRE or resiliency, it's the same problem. You need to have, you know, complete traceability on what was, you know, going into your source code repository and what exactly was really running in production. You, you know, absolutely need that, you know, to protect uh, your firm. Well, our time is up. I think a 25-minute panel on a topic this broad is a, something of a conference extreme sport, but I think our panelists did a, a terrific job of bringing out some of the most important issues. So thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.